Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShilohRelics.com. Hope you're having a great day. It's a little rainy down here, but hey, any day's a good day when we're above ground. I hope you guys are doing well. We're going to talk today about another artillery piece because you guys really seem to like the last one that I did on the Hotchkiss shell. The Hotchkiss shell is a Union shell, so today I thought, hey, we'll talk about a Confederate shell. And there's a couple of different wordings for projectiles. We have the solid shots, meaning that they are just a hunk of uh, iron or lead that were designed just to smash things. And then they had uh, shells, true shells, that were designed to explode. And they exploded by several different ways during the Civil War. They had them where they were time fuses where they would uh, fly a certain amount of time and the time fuse would detonate at a specific time. They had percussion fuses that would strike upon impact. They had several other versions. Uh, if you get a chance, there's a wonderful fuse book by Chuck Jones. It's out of print, but it's a really good book if you get a chance. It shows a lot of the variety of artillery shell fuses and there's a ton of them, more than you would ever imagine, and all kinds of different styles. Because you gotta remember, this is a war that started out with spears and ended up with uh, rockets, torpedoes, submarines, hand grenades. It progressed a long way in the four years of the war. This one is actually, I chose it because of the story that goes with it. In England, there was a fellow named Theopolis Alexander Blakely, and he got the idea to develop a cannon that had a um, cast iron core, and it had wrought iron or steel banding the breech of the gun to reinforce it. And he couldn't sell them to the British government. They didn't want them. So he decided, hey, I'm gonna sell them to the Confederacy. And that's exactly what he did. He had them made a couple of different places. They were made in uh, London, made in Liverpool. And if you get a chance to go to Shiloh National Battlefield, there's a place called Ruggles Line. And one of the smartest moves the Park Service ever did, they do a lot of good things right. This one they hit head on because they brought all of the Confederate cannon that were in the park and they lined them up in Ruggles line because Daniel Ruggles, it's where he was firing into the hornet's nest. And up until that point, it was the largest concentration of Confederate, or not even Confederate, of artillery concentrated in one point to that time in the world. And it ranges how many exact cannons he had firing, but there was over 50. One of the guns that they've got on the line is so cool because it's one of those uh, Blakely rifles and you can tell that it's split if there's no red wasps around because they love that cannon for some reason. Every time I try to show it to somebody over there, there's a ton of red wasps around it. So watch those. If there's none around, take a flashlight and look down the barrel. There's actually a split in the uh, metal and they have banded it. Now that's needing a cannon when you have to go in and band it so you can keep using it to fight a war. Back to the shell. Sorry, squirrel, I took a turn. I do that sometimes, scatterbrain. Um, for the shell, they didn't have many projectiles for those guns, so they made their own. They did fire what's known as a Britain shell. Uh, but this one is a Southern made 110% Confederate shell that went in that gun. Because it was a weird size, the bore diameter of it was 3.5 inches. And it's known as a 12 pound Blakely cannon, rifled cannon. Meaning that uh, it's 3.5 inches across the diameter. And it was rifled. That size is odd compared to most everything else. The US six pound cannon that you hear referred to fires a ball of 3.67 inches. So it's a completely different critter. One wouldn't fire any other. It has the iron body. It has, at the back of it, it has a copper plate. And that copper plate was designed to take the rifling of the cannon and make it fire more accurately. 
that plate is just a thick, thick piece of copper and it's held in place by a bolt. They screw that bolt directly onto the shell and there's a couple of different versions. This one is known as the flush base and there's also one that the bolt sticks out and isn't flush against it. And they have three little iron pins coming out of the projectile itself that in theory were designed to hold the Sabbat on. Not a great design on that part. So most of the time, the Sabbat has thrown, been thrown off. And that copper plate is called a Sabbat or a Sabo, depending on where you live. Um, this one has been fired. You can see the rifling marks from the cannon. Oh, and while I got it up, let's look at the top. It's just an open hole now. What that would have been at one time, they had a wooden fuse holder that went inside that, and it held a little piece of paper about that long. You guys bought it after the last video, so I can't show you until I get some more. A little time uh, fuse. And they, when they catch on fire from the blast of the cannon, they will burn a specific amount of time and explode after that time if that paper time fuse gets ignited. This one did not. So fortunately for us, we have a wonderful collectible. For the Confederate that was firing it, he was out of luck, unless it hit somebody directly. They made those Blakely cannons that this went in from all different kinds of sizes. As small as 2.5 uh, inches in diameter, they made them on up to a 12.75 bore diameter, which fired a solid shot of 650 pounds. Can you imagine a 650 pound projectile coming at you? No, thank you. I will pass on that one. Uh, in the book, they list these as a rarity of eight and a half or eight plus out of 10, which is very rare and they, I think they're rare than that because I've only had a couple over the years. The verbal history that came with this, and this gives me a chance to tell you something about verbal history. Verbal history is only as reliable as who you get it from, which is why if you look on my site, most of the things I don't have a location of recovery because if I don't know and I don't believe it, I don't put it on there. And like we said, I hadn't walked on any water, so it is possible to list the wrong history, but I try to keep the history of the piece and the location of recovery of the piece with it whenever possible. The verbal that came with this was that it was found in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is a neat area. If you get a chance, you need to go to Fredericksburg, Virginia. If you've never heard of Fredericksburg, Virginia, it's located halfway between Richmond in Washington, D.C., 100 miles each way, and it was fought over several times during the Civil War. It was campsites all through the war, and now it is an absolutely beautiful place, growing like a weed. But if you get a chance, go downtown. It's still got the old streets. There's a lot of cool little shops down there. Uh, my buddies at the Picket Post used to have a shop down there, great guys. Uh, but it's a wonderful town. The, the battlefield is there in town and they have a great museum and very nice people too. So, Confederate Mullane shell, fired from the Blakely rifle. Verbal history, recovered from uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Very rare, can be yours, $995 on shilohrelics.com. I also have lots of other projectiles. If $995 for a Civil War cannonball isn't in your price range, I understand. That's why I have everything from fragments for less than 20 bucks up to whole shells that will usually start two, $300. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. I have because artillery is always dear to my heart. I am very fortunate to get to be with you guys. I hope you have a wonderful evening. I hope you're kind to each other. I still want you, when you're out and about, say hi to somebody that you don't know. It don't take you but a second, and it might be the only time that somebody's nice to them all day long. Won't take but a minute. I love you, and I'll catch you on the next one.